Okay, so before the uh, podcast starts, I just want to say, yes, I am still on vacation. I'll be home on Wednesday. A new video will be coming out on Thursday. It will be a tech video. We go back to our normal routine. But I also wanted to explain, in this video, you guys may be hearing a clicking noise. That is actually the fan. There is something wrong with the fan. I apologize for that in advance. Um, I should have been more careful with that. I should have gone in another room. But it was really, really hot out here, guys. So I just had to work with what I had. So again, I apologize in advance for the clicking noise. But I hope that doesn't take away from the video uh, podcast. So... Without further ado, cue the intro. Hey, what is going on, everybody? Michael here. Welcome back to Outside the Cage. Uh, I haven't done these in a while. I actually kind of miss doing them. Uh, I'm resurrecting them because I'm getting back into UFC fully, and because I've been neglecting that, I do want to say I'm sorry for that. So welcome back, everybody. I hope you guys are tuning in for all my UFC fans. I know I haven't been neglecting you guys, I've been trying, but anyway, um, so basically today's podcast is we're just going to talk and recap what happened at UFC 239, talk about the future, and looking forward to 240. Now usually I have a guest on the show, as you guys know I had Joe Silverstein for the first two episodes, uh, but since then I uh, wanted to kind of just spread it out, have a little more people come on, and Joe is always welcome to come back if he feels like he should, but unfortunately for today, I wasn't able to contact him because I'm actually on vacation while making this podcast, so today is just me and me alone. So let's get right into it. So before we start in any of the matches, we have to address the big one, the one that made talk all over, and guys, <laughs> I didn't see this coming. So uh, Masvidal versus Ben Askren, wow. Now... Right out the gate, I knew the I knew that Masvidal was going to win that fight. Like I knew it. I knew Masvidal was going to win. I, I had a feeling in my heart because, like, Masvidal, in my opinion, when you dislike somebody that much to an extent that you really just you know like that fight in you, some point you're just going to be like, yeah, I know I'm going to win. And I had a feeling with Masvidal. Although I was rooting for Askren, because I won't lie, I love Ben Askren. I will be real with you guys. I remember watching him in one champions, and I loved it. Well, it's unfortunate that he's no longer undefeated, but the way he lost, the way that he lost is just, it's just unbelievable. So Masvidal obviously knew what he was going to do with that going to the ground, because Askren always does that when you fight him, because he's a grappler. Masvidal saw that coming, and with that flying knee, knocked him out, and in one of the shortest knockouts in UFC history. Now, everybody be talking about Masvidal's title shot, and I guess he deserves it because he's proven himself countless times. He's 34 and 13, and he's got a great resume. He's beaten some worthy fighters like Cowboy Cerrone, a couple of others, but to beat Ben Askren, the greatest grappler in the world, 19-0, that, to me, gives him a perfect chance to get a title opportunity. Now, for Ben, though, my concern is two things. One, this is going to be one of the hardest comebacks, in my opinion, because, first of all, everyone goes, oh, well, Michael Bisping did that, but he came back and became a champion. Here's the problem. Ben Askren, if you guys know, likes to talk shit about people, and while I do think he's not as bad as Conor McGregor, he still talks shit. This time, however... You were talking shit to a guy who you had beef with since 2008, talking all shit for almost 11 years, saying how you would beat him. You get to the fight, your second fight in UFC history, walking in with an undefeated clean slate. You come in, and then you fucking just, you lose. Like, think about it from like, this standpoint, guys. Ben Askren, 19 0, second fight in UFC, his first loss ever. And it loses in five seconds and makes history as the shortest knockout in UFC history. How do you bounce back from that? Like, how do you bounce back? I think he definitely may bounce back because I know Askren, he's not going to go down without a fight. And so far, he's been okay with the, uh, with the five-second knockout. He's been, he said, well, that sucked and shit. But everybody be talking a lot of crap, though, about Askren. I guess he does deserve some of it because, you know, you keep running your mouth. But there are some people that are going on Twitter and Instagram like, you know, messing with his wife and stuff. And to me, I feel like that's uncalled for. But, like, you know, messaging, you know, his wife and his kids on Instagram, like this here. So his wife posted a picture of their children. Somebody wrote, best wishes to Ben. Hope he recovers well. God bless you all. Is your husband still alive? Is Ben Askren still dead? Now, obviously, you know, maybe one or two of them are obviously sincere about Ben. But, like, come on now. 
Even Masvidal, of all things, says he does not agree with commenting on family members, especially with children. And even though Askren hasn't come out and said anything, like, come on now. You don't be going to his wife's prof profile and start messaging him. Like, that's disrespectful. Look, obviously, this is going to humble him up, and he's got to figure out a way to come back from this. But if there was a rematch, I'd probably go Askren, because Askren, I mean, even without the knee, if Askren was able to get him on the ground, I felt like he probably would have won. But anyway, I knew Masvidal was going to win, but I was rooting for Askren no matter what, but I just was not expecting that. So now that we got that out of the way, let's get to the second fight, which was Luke Rockhold against Jan Bakaloquiz. I don't know if I'm saying it right. And honestly, I just feel so satisfied every time Rockhold loses. Like, Rockhold is another fucker. He literally talks about how, oh, I could beat John Jones, how I'm the only man. And you lost, like, you lost your, like, two fights, 2018, and you lost in 2019. So what makes you think you could take on fucking, like, what makes you think that you could take John Jones? Like, are you serious? And the way he lost, like, he got lucky that first round. Had that bell lasted a couple of seconds, he would have been knocked down in the first round. But that second round, that one punch to the chin, boom. That was pretty impressive. Uh, John, I think he was a good fighter. He obviously came in prepared. He knew what he needed to do. And he was a good sport about it, you know. I love it. I think that that was a good win on him because he lost to Tiago Santos, who and Tiago got the title opportunity because of that. So this is a good way to kind of build yourself back up and also get a title fight in there. So yeah, good win to John. But Rockhold, you're another fucker that needs to go. But anyway, next up uh, was a welterweight fight between Diago Sanchez and Michael Ch uh, Ch Chiesa. I'm, I'm, I'm really bad at names. Uh, this was one of the fights that went the distance. Uh, Michael Schilling obviously won that fight. If, no matter how you look at it, he had ground control. He controlled the fight. Like He had everything in the bag. Diago Sanchez landed a few punches, but Michael Schilling was great on the ground. He tired him out, and he knew what to do. So no questions, no arguments. So good win from Michael there. Now we get to the co-main event, which I thought was a great fight, especially a great performance by Amanda Nunes. And the fight obviously was Amanda Nunes versus Holly Holmes. Fight ended in the first round, and I gotta tell you, that was really impressive. Now, props to Holly Holmes. Obviously, she's already cemented herself in legacy for taking down Ronda Rousey, and that alone is an accomplishment. So, I give her props on that, but still, going up against the women's bantamweight title, who is still the double champ, the, the current active double champ, Honestly, it's pretty cool to see that she's able to defend both titles in both weights. And the way she beat her was the same way that Holly Holmes beat Ronda Rousey with a kick to the face. So it's like deja vu almost. But Amanda Nunes obviously had control of the fight. She landed the most strikes. She had significant strikes. A little, actually, Holly Holmes had more significance. I think she had a little more reach and stuff. But when it came down to it, though, Nunes was just more prepared. And I give her props on that. So good fight to Nunez. I really give her a lot of credit. And last fight up of the night was the main event. John Jones versus Tiago Sanchez. Now this one on the other hand is a little split down the middle. So a lot of people argued that Tiago Sanchez should have won that fight. And that John Jones shouldn't have won. At first I was thinking that. I was thinking, yeah, you know what, you're right. Because Tiago Sanchez for the most part went the distance. He clipped him a few times, but John Jones had a few parts where he knocked him down, he had it knocked down, but if you look at the breakdown for the fight, you gotta understand, Jones was in control, Jones knew what to do, so it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't that he, he didn't deserve to win, he just knew what to do, now, I don't like to be an analytic, I don't like to pull up the, you know, the scorecards and stuff, but on paper though, if you look at this, uh, it was basically a 48-47. to uh, Mike Bell scored it in favor, I believe, of John Jones. Tiago Sanchez won with 48-47 by, um, by Judge... I uh, forgot what his name was. But the other judge, it was a narrow, like, honestly, like, I'm being honest, guys. I'm looking at the breakdown right now. It was a narrow fight. This could have gone either way. It didn't need, need to go in John Jones' still. It came closer than, you know, him ever losing the belt. It could have been a split decision, and even then, it would have still... So, for me, I feel like Sa Santos obviously had more control because he was able to kind of counter. He had a few good strikes, but Jones was just more of the upper man in that fight. He had control. He had reach. He kept backing him up against the cage. And when you look at the breakdown in percentages, John Jones landed 65% out of the 90 shots he threw. Tiago Sanchez led 43 out of the 166 strikes he threw. With significant strikes, John Jones, again... 
59 out of the 90, and Thiago Sanchez, 43. So again, same margin. But the point I'm trying to make is that because Jones threw less punches but landed more, he was able to take over and still keep control. Now, would I like to see um, a rematch? Because I know those two were injured. Because Thiago Sanchez, I think, hurt his ACL, and John Jones hurt his foot. So I would like to see a rematch. I think that would be pretty awesome because, again, Thiago Sanchez went the distance, and they had to go down to the narrow. So that, to me, is pretty awesome. So I'm hoping to see what happens from there. And that's really UFC 239. So 239 overall, in my opinion, was a very good uh, pay-per-view. I definitely think it was one of the best ones I've seen, especially with that Askren knockout. Like, that was crazy. And the women's fight was also, again, it was another great fight. And I really enjoyed it, honestly. It was a really good pay-per-view. Had a good time. And I definitely hope they can keep it going with 240. And just taking a look at 240, we got Max Holloway against Freddie Edgar, Chris Cyborg against Felicia Spencer, uh, Jeff Neal against Nico Prince, Oliver uh, Mercari versus Amir Tesanaka, whatever the hell. And then you've got uh, whoever hell is in middleweight. <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. I really don't know how to say your name. But yeah, that's what we're looking up to for 240. Then 241, we got DC defending his belt. And then we got the return of Nate Diaz, which I can't wait to see. 242, we got Khabib versus Dustin Poirier, which is another good one. So we got a lot of stacked up fights coming up. So it's going to be really interesting to see where UFC goes from here. But honestly, I am so hyped for the next UFC event. I'll definitely be covering it. I'll do a predictions video before I make my review. And I will definitely talk more. I wanted to do more in this video, but of course I got to keep it limited with just a recap. I know I wanted to talk about the future, but I don't have enough time. And also because I just don't have another person to talk to. But next time, I hope to get somebody else. But that's going to do it for Outside the Cage. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, hit the like button. If you disliked the video, hit the dislike button. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys when I get back. Thanks for watching and peace. So